Hey, Josh. Josh. I have to run at five because I've got to go to the web conference because I'm doing a keynote tomorrow morning. There's a million things I want to talk to you yeah, yeah. a lot about that data stuff. Are you in New York? Okay, so I mean, I'm occasionally in New York too. Oh. Can, you, can I, uh, okay. Uh, hello. Uh, we have the usual uh, last panel of the day uh, drop off, but uh, we will try to work our way through that and hopefully people will join us. Um, my name is David Dayen. Uh, I am a journalist. Uh, in uh, just two weeks' time, I uh, will take over as the executive editor of the American Prospect. Magazine, and uh, I'm also uh, author of a forthcoming book on the role of monopoly in daily life, which will be out next year. Uh, we on this panel are going to take a deeper look at the political impact of digital platforms. Uh, I'm eager to hear the reactions uh, of our panel uh, to the presentation and observations about how to deal with a, uh, a set of companies that have both political power through their size and influence and uh, as well as a gatekeeper function on political speech and, uh, and, and speech of the press. So uh, we have an excellent panel. We have uh, Fran uh, Francis Fukuyama of uh, uh, Stanford University, Claire Wardle of uh, First Draft and TED, uh, Ellen Weintraub, a uh, uh, commissioner on the Federal Elections Commission, and Barry Lynn, uh, whose reputation precedes him. So, uh, we're going to start with some presentations. Uh, uh, I'm going to get some reactions from the panel, and then we'll instigate a discussion, and then we'll give ample time for Q&A. So I'm going to start with uh, Francis Fukuyama, uh, and uh, he has some slides as well. So. No, I do not. I oh, you don't? don't. Okay. I do not have I'm slides. I'm sorry. He does not have slides. Yeah. Okay, so uh, thanks very much. Um, I am uh, the co-director of something called the Project on the Internet and Democracy and the Internet at Stanford that I co-direct with Nate Persilli. Nate, unfortunately, could not be here. Uh, you may know that he's one of the two people, along with Gary King, that was tasked with uh, trying to open up Facebook's data to academic uh, researchers. But we have a lot of projects now going on at Stanford uh, that are mostly in line with the sorts of things that, that uh, Josh and Nolan were describing in terms of basic uh, empirical research on what the impact of uh, social media and the internet was on, uh, on democracy, not just in the United States, but worldwide. But that's not my topic. Uh, I actually want to make a case uh, that, well, this is my, the conclusion I have come to as uh, a result, really, of work I did on the Knight uh, Commission on Trust, Media, and Democracy last year, that actually antitrust is the only way to uh, ultimately solve the problem of content moderation uh, on the internet. If the issue for democracy is fake news, conspiracy theories, um, uh, hate speech and the like uh, on social media, uh, I ultimately think that although regulation is theoretically possible, I think as a practical political project it's simply not going to work and that leaves uh, really antitrust as the major remedy. I know in the morning panels there is some skepticism about whether antitrust could be used for all these other purposes, but I do think actually that one of the areas in which competition is important is not just in the economy, but in the market for ideas and for speech. Uh, and if that uh, market is not kept uh, competitive, uh, that's got big consequences for democracy. So, uh, in, uh, there are obviously a lot of attempts to regulate uh, uh, speech on the internet. The Europeans have done a lot of things like the Nets DG law in Germany. A lot of Americans think they've overstepped with that. I'm, I at least think it's good that they're doing something because, uh, you know, if they don't get it right the first time, they'll make adjustments and uh, you'll work your way uh, to that. Uh, in the United States, obviously, uh, there's been this effort over the last couple of years on the part of the platforms and then other uh, organizations and civil society groups to pursue a kind of typically American uh, path of self-regulation. So I want to talk about both the, uh, the American and the European approaches first. Uh, self-regulation, I think, is com completely uh, inadequate. Uh, there have been a couple of different approaches to it. Uh, one is to try to use 
international human rights law somehow as a way of setting standards uh, for protecting, both protecting and promoting uh, free speech on the internet. Uh, I don't actually think that this is going to work because, uh, you know, Article 19 of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights is an extremely uh, broad article and it does not remotely provide the kind of guidance that uh, actual real regulation would uh, require. So for example, how many of you know what this is? Mm -hmm. Okay, so this okay sign is sometimes just an okay sign, but it's also increasingly been used by white nationalists as a way of signaling uh, their presence to one another. And so a couple of weeks ago when uh, the Estonian government, there's a new government and they have a new right-wing uh, anti-immigrant, anti-EU party that's entered their coalition. When they were sworn into the parliament, they all made this sign, right? And whether this sign is just, and, and so they were accused of being white nationalists, and what they said was, oh, Barack Obama has made this sign, and they showed pictures you know, on the internet of Barack Obama uh, doing this, and so therefore it's okay. Well, this is a kind of contextual judgment, and quite frankly, Facebook, uh, over the past year, 18 months, has been uh, trying to moderate content, uh, trying to regulate itself. It has been making all sorts of very complex judgments as to whether this is okay, whether, you know, Pee Pee the Frog is okay, whether a lot of other things that could be interpreted as hate speech uh, really are hate speech. I don't envy them uh, having to do this, but uh, I think that it's very hard to get any guidance from this, uh, certainly out of Article 19, another procedure is trying to use civil society, multi-stakeholder groups. Facebook has created an internal Facebook Supreme Court uh, where if you're arguing over what this means, uh, you can appeal it to this court and then there'll be an internal uh, juridical process that will determine whether this is a white nationalist sign or just an okay sign. Uh, I think this is also a, a hopeless enterprise because Facebook basically does not have the legitimacy ultimately to make this kind of decision. And I actually think that the uh, groups, the civil society groups that are being recruited into this kind of an effort are not fully representative of the whole political spectrum that exists either in the United States or in any of the particular countries uh, involved. You know, Breitbart is never actually included in you know, the consultations, the multi-stakeholder uh, consultations as to what's uh, unacceptable speech and what's not. Uh, and so I think those efforts are going to founder. Now, when you get to the question of more overt uh, government regulation, uh, there's actually one approach that's quite successful and that's public broadcasting. And it's funny that nobody talks about public broadcasting as a regulatory mechanism, but it is. It's, uh, it's particularly successful in uh, Northern Europe where you have ZDF or the BBC or you know, their equivalents in, in uh, Scandinavia or the Netherlands, uh, and they actually deal with the problem of fake news because they paternalistically decide what is good news and what's not. Uh, they will interrupt a sports match to tell you about uh, international, you know, uh, uh, international uh, crisis, and so they're basically uh, feeding their publics what they regard as something uh, other than fake news, and uh, as my colleague Shanto Iyengar has shown in a whole series of studies that he did in the early 2000s, it actually works. And so if you look at the level of knowledge, citizen knowledge in uh, places that have good uh, public broadcasters, you know, in Scandinavia, for example, it is significantly higher uh, than in a place like the United States where we basically let market forces determine uh, what people listen to. Problem with this approach is that it doesn't work everywhere. Uh, the biggest problem has been in Southern and Eastern Europe where the opening up of media markets has actually led to the capture of the public broadcasters. So the pioneer in this respect was Silvio Berlusconi that managed to uh, capture the uh, Italian public broadcasters as part of adding them to his media set uh, empire, but now this is a pattern that's being repeated uh, as, and it's interesting because as traditional legacy media declines, it becomes less and less a value proposition for people that want to make money but it is a big opportunity for people that want to exert uh, political influence. And so newspapers and TV channels in the Czech Republic, in Hungary, uh, in other countries tending towards populism uh, have been seeing the acquiring of um, 
uh, their media, legacy media channels by uh, oligarchs, basically, that can then use them for political, uh, for political purposes. Uh, and so that approach, I think, is also uh, problematic. Now, I want to get into the specific issue uh, of the First Amendment. Uh, and the, the assertion was made on the previous panel that uh, social media and the platforms are protected by the First Amendment. And I would suggest that's probably largely true, but not, uh, not completely. Uh, and uh, it, in this respect, I think it's important to look at uh, some of the history of regulation of media, uh, legacy regulation, because it provides some interesting precedents for uh, the, the regulation of the digital uh, space. Now, typically, newspapers have not been heavily regulated. I mean, um, democratic governments don't censor in the sense of controlling, you know, in a minute way, uh, content. In most cases, they do it through licensing, through subsidies, that sort of thing. In this sphere, uh, newspapers have been relatively lightly regulated. Uh, but this was not the case with broadcast media, uh, radio uh, and television, which from the beginning was recognized to be uh, a rather different kind of medium because of the concentration of power. So those of you that are old enough like me to remember the days when there were just three TV networks, you know, over the air broadcast TV networks, uh, this was the day in which um, uh, the uh, U.S. government asserted a right to actually control the content that those broadcast uh, channels carry. There's a long history to this. Uh, it starts with the Radio Act of 1927, the Communications Act of 1934. By the way, I'm a political scientist. I'm not a lawyer. So I know there's a lot of lawyers in the room, so I stand to be corrected on some of these facts. But the original Communications Act that created the uh, FCC actually said that one of the objectives of this new body would be to promote public interest, not simply the commercial uh, interest of, uh, uh, of the broadcasters. Uh, and that was interpreted over the years by the FCC as giving it a mandate to control the content uh, of things that were put on the air by, uh, by broadcasters. This was challenged in the courts on a number of constitutional grounds on the basis of the takings clause, on the basis of the Interstate Commerce Clause, both of those were struck down. The most important one, obviously, though, was the uh, objection that this violated uh, the First Amendment. There's a history to this where uh, there was a case uh, that went before the Supreme Court, the Red Lion case in 1969, and actually it has a lot of resonance for today because Red Lion was a very conservative kind of conspiracy-minded uh, radio show that was accusing people of being part of a larger communist conspiracy and so forth. And the question was whether the FCC had the right to force uh, the, the channel to provide countervailing uh, information. There's also a statutory uh, amendment to the Communications Act, Section 315, that was interpreted as giving the FCC uh, the right to do this. And so in other words, it was a statutory basis for regulation that was not that dissimilar to the public broadcast standard that was being used in Europe, that the government had an interest in promoting public interest and not simply the private interest uh, of the stations. And this is what led to the uh, fairness doctrine. And I think that uh, the thought that I will leave you with is that the, if you look at the history of the fairness doctrine, uh, it is a mess. <laughs> uh, and uh, it shows the difficulty of actually having the government as a practical matter try to regulate uh, 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 a media uh, platform uh, for content, right? So the fairness doctrine actually was pushed mostly by liberals. Uh, they didn't like the fact that you had these conservative crackpots, you know, in their view, uh, uh, spouting, you know, nonsense. Uh, but conservatives thought that this was biased against them. And this was in the days when AM radio was just getting its start, you know, Rush Limbaugh, um, Fox News was still a, a gleam in, in Roger Ailes' eyes. But as those media outlets began to grow, uh, I think the, the politics of the, the fairness doctrine became uh, increasingly partisan. And so Republicans wanted uh, a repeal of the fairness doctrine, uh, and uh, Democrats uh, defended it. Uh, eventually, 
uh, and this is where the lawyers will have to tell me exactly how this stands right now. There was never a Supreme Court case that really tried to establish the constitutionality of the Fairness Doctrine. It was rescinded by the FCC itself uh, in the 1980s. The Democrats tried to legislate it uh, by statute several times. Subsequently, it was vetoed once by Ronald Reagan, once by uh, Bush 41, and after that, uh, they basically gave up. So there is no fairness doctrine, but the legacy that I think it leaves you with is just showing in a, a polarized uh, partisan political atmosphere, uh, it is impossible to decide on what is fair and balanced, right? That's the slogan of uh, Fox News, uh, and any liberal would say, that's not fair and balanced, you know, that's highly partisan. Uh, but what then is fair and balanced? Is it fair and balanced to kick Alex Jones off of YouTube, right? Uh, I think that that is a political, you know, it's an intensely political judgment uh, that is, you know, very complex and you can make arguments uh, for and against it, but there is certainly no clear public interest standard that will tell you what is, you know, out completely out of bounds and, uh, and what is not. So the, the reason I get to antitrust is the following. Um, I have for a long time believed that actually the platforms should act like media companies. They shouldn't hide behind this pretense that they're just platforms, they're just neutral platforms. Uh, I think that Section 230 that was referred to earlier has been widely misinterpreted uh, as, as actually promoting their uh, neutrality as a platform. It's just the opposite. Section 230 of the CDA was put there in order to allow them to curate the material on their platforms without fear. The government couldn't interfere, but you know, the fear was that private litigation would stop them from uh, doing takedowns and things like that. And Section 230 is put there to protect that uh, ability for them to act basically like the New York Times or like you know, the Wall Street Journal or any other media company that wants to say, this is acceptable and this is not. Uh, so I think they need to do this, but you have this problem of size. They are not like the Wall Street Journal or the New York Times or the newspaper industry in which you have actually a big variety of alternative uh, political voices out there that you can choose between. Uh, you know, nobody complains about the New York Times not publishing Alex Jones, right? It's perfectly within its uh, uh, scope to do that, uh, but they do complain about uh, Facebook doing it, and I think with a certain justice because Facebook has become, uh, or YouTube uh, and Facebook have become kind of universal public platforms. They are assuming a quasi-public uh, role in our political system. And as a result, uh, what they do matters a lot. If they take down Alex Jones, it's really not like the Times not publishing him. It really uh, prevents him from reaching you know, uh, a, a significant uh, audience. Uh, so that's how I ended up uh, thinking that antitrust is actually an important uh, remedy here, because if you decide that all of these different approaches to regulation in our highly polarized political situation in the United States today, you know, it may work in Europe, but in the United States today, we are so highly polarized, I cannot imagine an FCC in the future that could agree on what is fair and balanced uh, coverage on the part of an internet platform or an FTC or any other federal agency. And if that's the case, what you gotta do is make these platforms smaller. I have no idea to do, uh, how to do that. That's <laughs> why I came to this conference to learn you know, how you'd proceed. But uh, the conclusion that I'm left with is if you wanna solve the content moderation problem uh, on, the, um, uh, on the internet, you have to address, address the size problem. Thank you. Thank you. Maybe, maybe later we'll talk about the 1996 Telecom Act and the media consolidation yeah. uh, therein, because uh, that was as consequential as the 88 Fair Fairness Doctrine takedown. All right, uh, we're going to Claire Wardle. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for uh, inviting me here today. Um, I do about three of these conferences a week, and it's actually really refreshing to be in a room where I hardly know any of you. So that's, that's, we're breaking down the silos, so that's exciting. Um, I'm an academic by training. I'm a social scientist. I'm a qualitative researcher. But for the last 10 years, I've been a practitioner. I got frustrated that only my mum was reading the things that I was writing. And for the last 10 years, I've been deeply 
steeped in this world of misinformation. So I'm not a lawyer, I'm not a political scientist, and I'm not an American, as you can tell from my accent. And so when I thought, what could I add to this conversation? Many of you are very smart and know this stuff deeply. I thought what I could add at 4 p.m. is a number of images that will remind us what this stuff looks like and the complexity of this stuff and the global interconnected nature of this stuff. Because I think if we don't, it's very easy to sit in rooms like this and be very distanced from that. So that's really what I wanted to do uh, today. So um, I lead an organization called First Draft. And for the last four years, we've been working around the world helping monitor mis- and disinformation connected to elections, doing a lot of throwing spaghetti at the wall to try and work out what sticks. Because my frustration is we know so little about this space. We've all been discussing this. How can we do something and actually find data? So for example, one of the projects we worked on was in Brazil. We had a coalition of 24 newsrooms. And we had a central WhatsApp number. We, we received 250,000 WhatsApp messages from Brazilians asking us to check whether this was true or not. That's now the most powerful data set we have around disinformation on an encrypted message app. So if we want to do this, we've got to start trying to find ways around this, because I agree, one day we might get some data from the platforms, but I worry it won't be anytime soon. So as I said, we did these different projects. Some were specialized newsrooms where we would set up a group of journalists monitoring this kind of content and then sending out alerts to platforms and newsrooms. And others were these collaborations with newsrooms, teaching them how to find, verify, and then responsibly report this. We have real challenges now. I would really enjoyed many of your comments, but most journalists today have no idea how to responsibly report on misinformation. And in many ways, they are disproportionately amplifying and giving additional oxygen to rumors that previously would just sit around the breakfast table and your mum would go, ooh, Alec, have you heard that about the new incels? No, pass the tea. Now, somebody <laughs> goes straight to their mobile phone and Googles incel and finds all this information that previously they couldn't. So the interconnected part of this is what's so important. And so, um, as we showed, we would write these reports and we would have normally competitive newsrooms with their logos sitting side by side. And so what we found from that is we can't use up resources asking different newsrooms to actually monitor this kind of content. And bringing newsrooms together allowed them to collaborate and make decisions about responsible reporting. And that collaborative model is something that I would love to see us work in other spaces. So for example, around anti-vax content, could we have the WHO, the CDC, and the Nigerian Health Ministry sitting side by side? So there's a whole host of things that we could be working on. But one of the things I wanted to stress from working so much outside the US is to understand the complexity of how these platforms operate. And so understanding free basics and what that looks like in Brazil, so that most Brazilians are only accessing information on WhatsApp because it doesn't cost them anything. But what that means is they never click on a link to go and verify that in Google, because that costs them data. So within WhatsApp, they're just sharing screenshots, and that's the only information they have. And on the flip side, there are paywalls to access quality media. So in that environment, what does that look like? And what does it look like in an environment when we talk about internet shutdowns, but we have free basics where that's the only way that people can access information? So I know this conversation is focused on the US, but whatever you do here will have a disproportionate impact on the rest of the world. And for us to remember that in all of our conversations is all that I would ask here today. And the other thing, I know that you know this, but encrypted apps of the future. When Mark Zuckerberg talks about a pivot to privacy, it's because he already knows there has been a chilling effect on speech. Facebook newsfeed looks nothing like it used to, even a year ago. In places like Indonesia, where the use of Facebook was off the scale, everybody's moving to Facebook Messenger because the chilling effect of regulation in Indonesia. And so what that means is we're now facing a situation where the speech that we're so concerned about is moving into spaces that we just can't see. And I am a huge proponent of encrypted spaces in communities, but what does it mean when we haven't figured out and we haven't provided the necessary resiliency for populations to understand how to navigate a polluted information ecosystem when they have leapfrogged right over laptops and email addresses, they've gone straight to their digital smartphone and a WhatsApp number. So the reason that Facebook acquired WhatsApp was because there's no way that everybody around the world would ever have an email address to come onto Facebook but everybody would have a mobile number. And so WhatsApp was the answer. So understanding these dynamics is so critical and understanding that it's not just WhatsApp. That's what the New York Times and the Washington Post is obsessed with. But when you start looking around the world and understanding that in Myanmar it's Viber, in Russia it's Telegram, in South Korea it's Kakao Talk, TikTok, are we talking about TikTok? I mean, <laughs> we're having conversations and we're talking about Facebook, Twitter, Facebook, Twitter. That's not our future. And what I worry about is that we're regulating for 2016 in the US and we're not actually thinking about what the future looks like and what it looks like globally. And so this is an updated dynamic map that Pointer makes that I just use actually all the time, which is different interventions around the world that governments are taking around misinformation. And some of them are from threats, some of them to really problematic 
uh, regulation. And if we actually look at the scale of what's happening and how you're seeing different governments copycat what's happening in other countries, that's my fear. I agree, Germany was good, they got out there, they did something, we realized very quickly that it was problematic. But by that time, Singapore was like, oh, that looks nice, we'll have a bit of that. But with no actual understanding of what that looks like in a completely different regime. So one of my biggest issues here is about the terminology. So we talk all the time about problematic content or harmful content with no understanding of what this is. I created this in my pajamas in February 2017 because I was so frustrated by the term F asterisk 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 news, which I refuse to use because it's A, doesn't explain the complexity of this space in any degree, and secondly, it's been weaponized and used against a, a free and independent press. But just trying to say to people, this isn't about what's true or false. The biggest challenge we have is the weaponization of context. 2016, it was much more about fabrication. Now, it's much more about weaponization of context. The most effective piece of disinformation online are that which have a kernel of truth to it, which makes it even harder for all the things that you just described to make decisions about content moderation. I also published this was trying to distinguish between misinformation, disinformation, and malinformation. Genuine information, but the sharing of private to public makes that harmful. But then the, the term harm, we haven't grappled with the term harm. I mean, I'm looking at a room of lawyers, but. The, the fact that we're using terminology that is so slippery on something that it's so troubling is what concerns me. And this was created by Full Fact. It's their pagoda of harms. Ridiculously simplistic. All of these should be torn apart, and we should have undergraduates or even graduate students spending semesters and semesters trying to work on this stuff. This is us just trying to put something out to start a conversation. But we're so focused on political disinformation. And one thing I'd say about the panic right now about vaccinations is, at least we're starting to think about real world harms. And if that means that we can start thinking about inter interventions around that type of speech, try that type of speech, and then say, what does that look like afterwards? So back to the previous panel, we just did, we used um, Lucid panel data in 12 countries, and we asked people what they would search for if they had to learn, would I vaccinate my child? And so we've got hundreds of search strings from around the world, and then we asked them to send us screenshots. When you start seeing qualitative data from around the world, you realize how powerful it is. So very quickly, this was the most shared image during the Brazilian election. It's a genuine image of ballot papers, but the rumor circulating on WhatsApp that these have been pre-programmed for Haddad. Um, this is another piece of information that goes viral constantly, looking at different statistics around crimes. Any fact checkers in the room? <laughs> What's the problematic word? Federal. So because most crimes are state crimes, federal crimes involve a border. So the problem with this is how do we label this and what do we do about it? So just finally, um, I just want to say this stuff is genuine, but it is harmful. This was circulating before the midterms. This stuff, how do we think about how the stuff that's online moves offline? These were lots and lots of memes around the coming second civil war in the US. If we don't understand the severity of this type of speech, and I understand everything you're saying, but my worry is if we just think about antitrust as the answer, how do smaller platforms stop us when we have these types of problems around speech? So that's just what I wanted to say, that we need to be mindful of this when we're thinking about regulation. It's much more serious than since you some words on a page. Thank you. All right. Ellen, and you can stay here if you want. I mean, you can go up. And yeah, I'm just going to stay it. here, I okay. think. If this, is, this is comfy for me if everybody can see me. All right. Okay, do I have that? All right, I want to make sure everybody can see me and hear me, yeah? Okay, so um, I am also sort of an anomaly in this room. Uh, I'm not an antitrust specialist. In fact, when I was originally invited to do this and then I got a reminder and it said something about antitrust conference, I said, what? How did I get end up on an antitrust <laughs> conference? That's not what I do. That's not who I am. Um, I am a lawyer. Uh, I am uh, uh, not an academic. What I am, and this is, I think, also fairly unusual in, he, in this room, is I'm a regulator. I'm the chair of the Federal Election Commission, and we actually do regulate some of what we've been talking about here. Not all of it, not the antitrust aspects, but the transparency aspects of uh, internet advertising is something that we actually have jurisdiction over. Uh, so I want to give, uh, everybody's been talking about different metrics for um, how to measure the extent of the issue or problem or however you want to describe what we're talking about here. Um, so uh, I have some statistics also. Digital ad spending, got this from Axios, uh, in the United States will grow 19% in 2019 to $129 billion. 
dollars. Okay, so that is real money. Uh, and it is 54% uh, of the estimated total US ad spending. So more than half of ad spending is moving online. Uh, now, if you look at political spending, which is what I am particularly interested in, uh, based on where, where I come from, um, political spending and political advertising goes up with every election. That's a, that's a given. In 2018, in, uh, in the midterms, there was about $4 billion spent on advertising. Now, most of it was not spent online. Uh, about $3 billion of it was spent on local broadcast television, which you know, I think is a, um, that's going to be declining over the years. About $900 million went to online advertising. And you know, while that is a smaller percentage, uh, it represented a 260% increase, increase for online spending for political ads over the last midterms in 2014. So there is just an exponential rise in the amount of money that um, candidates and political parties and others who are trying to influence elections and policy are spending online. So this is really a huge arena. Now, where do we come in? Well, we're in the disclosure business. So um, we are in the business of making sure that you know where this information is coming from. And obviously, in 2016, people's antenna got raised because it turned out that a lot of the information that people were getting about politics was coming from Russia. Well, we didn't expect that. But it, uh, according to Facebook, 126 million people on Facebook were exposed to propaganda that was generated in Russia. Another 20 million got information on Instagram. Uh, and then there were over 1,000 videos posted to YouTube, and there were uh, a bunch of tweets. But you know, just between Facebook and Instagram, there was 156 million people who were exposed to this information. Now, the number of voters in that election was only 137 million. So I don't know if there was a complete overlap there, but that's you know, pretty wide penetration. Did it make a difference? Nobody knows. I've heard all sorts of people talk about this. I've heard people say very authoritatively that um, you know, obviously it must have had an impact. And other people say, oh, it couldn't possibly have had an impact. And honestly, I don't think anybody knows. But it's a problem either way. I am deeply concerned about the possibility that foreigners are trying to influence and affect who gets elected in the United States. Because there's actually a law against that. <laughs> there is a law that says foreigners are not allowed to spend money to influence elections in the United States, and that is at the federal, the state, and the local level. The Federal Election Commission generally doesn't have jurisdiction over, the, over state and local elections, except when it comes to foreign spending. That's how important it was. Congress gave us jurisdiction over the whole ball of wax. So I was interested to hear, uh, and I can't wait to, wait to read the panel, the uh, paper that was the white paper that was discussed in the last panel. That one of the suggestions was that foreign um, uh, ad spending would be disclosed. Um, I would, I think that would be great. I would love to see it disclosed because then we can go after them because it's all illegal. So um, that is of great concern to me. But of course, it's a tricky business regulating even who, uh, what kinds of ads have to have these kinds of disclaimers on them. Now, Facebook, of course, ran into some huge headwinds once this information came out as to how much information was being uh, sent into this country from Russia to influence our election. Uh, and you know, it turned out that they were actually accepting ads, uh, payment for ads in rubles, which should have been a tip off. And I think they've got that now. They're not doing that. So they have, you know, to their credit, uh, come up with their own plan for now they are offering a lot more information about who's behind the ad spending, uh, uh, particularly when it comes to political ads. And they really got out in front of us on this because, you know, I, I was again interested when I saw uh, the FEC show up in the alphabet soup on uh, one of the former panelists' charts and more towards the independent side. Well, thank you very much. We are an independent agency. Uh, I don't know how much anybody in this room knows about the FEC, evenly divided between Democrats and Republicans by statute, or rather no more than three of the six commissioners who are supposed to be there um, can be of one political party. In practice, it usually works out to three Democrats and three Republicans. Right now, we're down two commissioners, and we have two Republicans, one Democrat, and one independent who sits on the Democratic side of the table. So um, you know, we have a huge ideological battle that goes on on a daily basis at the FEC over how much we are going to regulate. 
and what ads constitute the kind of ads that we can regulate. The Supreme Court says we can regulate express advocacy and the functional equivalent of express advocacy, ads that no reasonable person would look at and, um, and not understand that they were political ads. And believe me, you wouldn't have a hard time when you saw these ads trying to figure out which ones were campaign oriented and which ones weren't, and yet we continue to have massive disagreements about this at the FEC on a, you know, a, a weekly basis. So, um, sorry, that was, my phone was buzzing. One of my colleagues was trying to call me right now to find <laughs> out about, you know, what's the latest uh, disagreement. Uh, we are in the process of trying to do a rulemaking on the smallest possible aspect of this, just trying to improve the disclosure of um, who's behind ads that say directly vote for and vote against online. And the reason that we are only carving out this itty bitty part of it is that I threw, you know, half a dozen to a dozen different proposals on the table and I could not get buy-in from my colleagues to even begin the rulemaking on anything other than this. Now this is an issue, this, this business of, of uh, disclaimers and disclosure of online political ads has been around for years. We put it out for public comment a number of years ago and got six comments as to whether we should launch a rulemaking on this. And then, you know, we tried it again and we got seven comments. And then after the Russia story broke, I said, Let's put that one out for comment again. And suddenly we got 150,000 comments. Everybody wants us to regulate this, and yet it is very hard to get that regulation done. So I appreciate that Facebook has, uh, and some of the other platforms have gotten out in front of this and tried to do their own um, uh, better disclaimers on their ads. They are struggling too, though, with the definitions. And while they were initially very resistant to any form of regulation, I think they've kind of got a love-hate relationship going with it now and, and have, in some instances, actually said that they would welcome more federal involvement in helping them define what exactly is it that they are supposed to be putting these disclaimers on. Uh, there's a couple of good bills in Congress, both the Honest Ads Act and the Disclose Act, would help us get better information about um, what we're seeing online, and I am a supporter of both of them. But, you know, guess what? We're polarized at the FEC, and Congress is also polarized and is having trouble uh, getting these laws passed. So I think that there is certainly cause for regulation. There's cause for concern, particularly when it comes to uh, ads that are being uh, placed and, and information. It's not just ads. There is um, this whole media campaign that went on that involved you know, bots and placing um, uh, misleading information out there that looked like it was from an American citizen and then it would get shared by other people and people were talking to bots online not even realizing they were talking to bots. Um, uh, protests were organized by people in other countries who were masquerading as Americans. This is a huge area of concern, I think, for us because um, while most of the time what we do is limited by uh, First Amendment concerns, when it comes to foreign intervention, no one other than Brett Kavanaugh, former judge of the D.C. Circuit and now on the Supreme Court, when faced with this question, wrote an opinion that said, this isn't a First Amendment question when you're looking at foreign intervention in our elections. It's a question of whether we get to define who is part of our political community. And the answer is, yes, we do. And I think because of that, we have uh, a basis in law and in the Constitution for moving forward and for writing stronger laws and stronger rules that will help protect us. So I will stop there. Thank you. Uh, I'm going to go to Barry right now, and then we'll get some uh, discussion. Um, <clears throat> thank you, David. And I uh, wanted to actually th uh, start off by thanking Guy and Luigi for organizing another terrific, a third straight, really terrific conversation about these issues here at Stigler. And actually, just on, as an aside, I mean, given the topic of this conference, I thought it was a really nice touch of you guys to arrange for the partial demolition of the Chicago Tribune building next door. Uh, you know, in terms of illustrating the state of journalism in America today, that was, that was really nice. Um, you know, I, I'm proud of this community of people. You know, um, we have, you know, compared to what we saw two years ago in this discussion, you know, we've seen a phenomenal advance in understanding the problem. 
and understanding and, and sort of pushing the discussion about what to do about it. This is true in the academy, it's true among business leaders, it's true among the public, it's true among, in our political debate. You know, just in the last two weeks, we've seen a couple of really huge things. I mean, we, uh, this article that Chris Hughes published in the New York Times, it was an amazing article, had an amazing effect. Uh, this, the, the case uh, uh, you know, decided Monday in the Supreme Court, Apple versus Pepper, you know, written by Brett Kavanaugh. That's uh, an important, we haven't, that may prove to be a very important case, and it may be a, prove to be a very important uh, sort of illustration of what's in Brett Kavanaugh's head. Um, but I believe that we have some way still to go. You know, the, this panel is supposed to focus on the effects of platforms on, on democracy. You know, Luigi this morning asked us, he said, you know, a century from now, uh, you know, will we be able to say that we saved democracy? And from what I've seen here today, you know, thus far, I think the answer will be no. We did not. You know, instead, what we have seen in, in a number of these discussions is a resistance to admit the magnitude of the threat that monopoly that these platforms pose to democracy and to our individual liberty. You know, we've seen this in these documents that have been put forth. We see this in these presentations. There have been a couple of exceptions. You know, a couple of people have put forward pretty strong uh, points. But, you know, there are, we know this, there are many ways in which monopolization threatens democracy. This includes, as we spoke about in this venue two years ago, soaring inequality. It includes, as we talked about last year, the degradation of the citizen through addiction to these, these technologies, through the isolation that these technologies as they are now used to sort of impose upon people. It's important to add that, you know, in terms of national security, you know, as I've written about extensively, consolidation has made complex international systems subject to cascading sudden uh, catastrophic crashes. It has, you know, consolidation has formed chains of dependency, of coercion, with China and other uh, 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 nations that are extremely dangerous. A fourth threat to democracy, the destruction of the public through the destruction of price. This is something that economists might want to turn their attention to. First degree price discrimination, first degree terms discrimination, by monopolies to provide vital goods and services is leading to the atomization of the public. The issue is not that the price is free, it's that the price is imposed from outside the market. The issue is that price is a function not of competition, but a tool of power. Without a public price, you don't have a public. Without a public, you cannot protect democracy. All of these are the results of a revolution a generation ago in how we do competition policy in America. You know, and let me put a little meat on this, this, this discussion about the threat that this poses to democracy by looking at the state of journalism today, specifically at the ways in which Google and Facebook and the way they use their power to affect the uh, news and information. And you know, just to be clear, I speak as someone who has worked uh, you know, in various ways for more than 30 years as a journalist. First, misinformation and propaganda. We have seen our societies hugely disrupted by lies and, and simple craziness, as we've heard. There is nothing new about misinformation and propaganda. We can read about it in Thucydides. <laughs> what is new today is that Google and Facebook have built machines designed to use the secrets of the individual to manipulate the individual. These machines have become amazingly powerful, almost perfect mechanisms for amplifying propaganda and misinformation. These two corporations make a lot of money, tens, hundreds of billions of dollars from renting out these machines to just about anyone who comes along, be it a white power moron or Vladimir Putin. We cannot have democracy if we turn our broadcast platforms over to control by foreign agents and tribalists and anarchists. Second, the starving of journalism. We have seen our society hugely disrupted by the collapse of journalism at the local level and at many other levels. You know, Matt Stoller spoke about this earlier. He said, you know, as he pointed out, two-thirds of all U.S. counties now have no newspapers. 
You know, what we're talking about is thousands and thousands and thousands of journalists, of reporters and editors who are you know, on our streets, they're not on our streets. We cannot have democracy without fully independent journalism, regulated by a need to compete in markets. Third, the automation of fear. You know, in February of last year, my friend Nick Thompson, who's the editor of Wired, he published a feature in fa on Facebook and included this rather concise description of fear. Every publisher knows that. At best, they are sharecroppers in Facebook's massive industrial farm. And journalists know that the man who owns the farm has the leverage. If Facebook wanted to, it could quietly turn any number of dials that would harm a publisher by manipulating its traffic, its ad network, or its readers. That was 14 months ago, 15 months ago. A few weeks ago, Nick updated that piece with an article titled 15 Months of Fresh Hell Inside Facebook. In this recent article, Nick tells us that just after the first article appeared last year with that quote in it, this is a quote from the new article, traffic from Facebook suddenly dropped by 90% and for four weeks it stayed there. After protestations, emails, and a raised eyebrow or two about the coincidence, Facebook finally got to the bottom of it. An ad run by a liquor advertiser had been mistakenly categorized, categorized as engagement bait by the platform. In response, the algorithm had let all the air out of Wired's tires. The publication could post whatever it wanted, but few would read it. Once the error was identified, traffic soared back. Nick concluded by doubling down on what he wrote last year. It was a reminder that journalists are just sharecroppers on Facebook's giant farm. Let's clarify the lessons of what Nick wrote, what Wired experienced. In response to what was a very positive article overall, an article that was structured to provide Facebook with ample room to prove its good intentions, Facebook responded by shutting Wired down and keeping them shut down for a month. Today, in America and in Europe, our newspaper publishers understand something very well. So to our news producers and our book publishers and our online native publishers, our reporters and editors and book authors, they all understand that someone somewhere has the power to cut off their pathway to the reader and to cut off what little revenue remains in the system. We cannot have democracy unless every one of us, every citizen feels free to speak their mind every moment, every day. And this is nowhere more true than with influential members of our society. And I'm not just talking about reporters and publishers and authors here. Business executives at major corporations, academics, think tank scholars, none must ever fear to speak their mind for fear of retaliation. And yet every day, more and more people do. You know, so where are we now? We're entering a third stage of monopolization in America. You know, since the triumph of the libertarian movement a generation ago, or the libertarian uh, philosophy and economics, the first stage lasted from 1981 maybe to the crash of 2008. During that period, we saw a consolidation of, demo of the democratic economy into what could best be described as Simon Johnson of the IMF did so in 2009 as an oligarchy made up of a few hundred corporate and banking masters, each in charge of some domain or other. The second stage has lasted from about 2009 to about now. In this stage, we've seen a pyramiding of power into the hands of three great master manipulators who have captured direct economic, hence political control, over many of the most powerful actors of the first stage of consolidation. Now we're entering a third stage in which the people and their representatives are awakening to the fact that what we were told, foremost by people in the Chicago school, was an invisible hand of the market is actually a very visible fist. In response, we see the great masters responding with ever more blatant forms of thuggery. More threatened, they become more dangerous. Tyler, earlier, Tyler Cowen earlier spoke about the threats to the rule of law. Amen. The rule of law is very much at stake in our country today. So what do we do? First, accept the fact that the will of the people will prevail. We will fix this problem and we will do so soon. Second, 
We should understand that we do not need any new law or any new institutions. We do not have to wait for Congress to create some new office or other. We have every single tool that we need already at hand. You know, some of them may end up surprising us. You know, if we actually understand that Amazon and the way it uses its power over the people who depend on it is in many ways an extortion and protection racket, maybe we could figure out a way to use RICO law. Third, the main thing we must ensure is that the providers of essential communications and information services are subject to common carrier style regulation. There must be no first degree discrimination in price or terms be it towards the end user or the provider. You know, breaking up these corporations, that would improve the matters around the margins. But the first thing we must do is outlaw all first degree discrimination in price and terms. Fourth and last, it's time to get economics out of law. You know. <laughs> Back at least to the time of Abraham, we have struggled to bring law into alignment with justice. You know. A generation ago, we allowed law to be made subject to economics. This concentration of power and control we see today is the result. Going forward, economics can observe, economics can comment, but economics shall never again sit in the seat of judgment. So. Thank you. I can't believe it. Barry Lynn gave a stem wander. Um, so I, I want to start this discussion uh, uh, by sort of reacting a little bit to the last panel because I, I think the overriding kind of sentiment on the last panel was this idea that we don't have enough data on this, uh, uh, this, this political problem that specifically around social media and that we need to uh, create some authorities to collect some more data. And it's a very academic solution to what I think is a political problem. And uh, in this, in, in just these four discussions, we heard a lot of data. We heard that there uh, is $128 uh, $29 billion of digital ad spending uh, expected in 2019. We have 10 Ks that can show uh, plenty of data on Google, Facebook, and Amazon and uh, the nature of their political power. We have the two-thirds of counties without a news outlet that shows a, a, certainly a certain resonant data about uh, the loss of uh, uh, news and information within our society. We, we have the data of, uh, you mentioned Amazon, and I'm kind of stunned that Amazon wasn't mentioned on the panel in terms of their political power. We know that they have, uh, uh, through something called the Amazon Amendment, created a pro procurement uh, uh, database uh, for purchases of government, both at the local and the federal level, the FEC is going to be getting pens from Amazon uh, uh, through this procurement database that has been set up, and they will be the sole provider of that. The CIA's secrets are in the Amazon cloud. Uh, the idea that we don't have data on the political power of uh, an Amazon is, is, is just kind of ridiculous. So uh, I want to hear some reaction to the idea that we don't have enough data about the nature of this, this problem. And whether, am, am I wrong in, in thinking that there, 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 there's a pretty rich data set out there that suggests uh, uh, some sort of uh, concentration of power here? Well, it, <laughs> there's data and data. So um, yeah, there's, there's the kind of data that you cited about uh, aggregate numbers of you know, users and the size of Amazon Cloud. But I think that um, Josh is right when he says that we actually have been attributing political consequences to some of these actions where we really don't know whether that's the case. For example, uh, the whole business about um, uh, you know, filter bubbles and uh, the idea that you're unduly influencing people you know, using social media. I think a lot of the empirical studies that have been done just in the last year or so have tended to show that, you know, to the extent that this has any effect at all, it actually just reinforces people that are pretty committed already. Sure. Uh, that very few people are actually persuaded by fake news, you know, uh, things that they read on the uh, internet. And in a certain sense, you know, there's a kind of moral panic over 
that, and I think that is a little bit dangerous if it, you know, makes you rush to certain solutions. I, I, I think I definitely want Claire to respond to that because she's seemingly panicked about, about the thing that that uh, that he just. He just mentioned. Do you think filter bubbles are an uh, uh, overblown? Uh, yeah, I, I think we. When I go to panels and people talk about oh the terrors of polarization okay. and the terrors of oh, this, okay. that does we don't know enough about that at right. all. We know that there's a lot of bad stuff on there. We don't. We've got a lot of descriptive data. But haven't we, we haven't never got, known? I mean, you know, at, ten years ago, the, the the scourge that would be of like kind of this would be email forwards of re 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 from your uncle. Uh, about something to do with uh, a, a, a you know viral piece of content, and it would go all Historians over the will internet. look back and say we had this weird 10 years where people publicly said what they were going to do and what they thought. Before that, people were around dinner tables or down the pub in my country, right. and we didn't know what they were talking about. Then we had this weird time when we <laughs> thought we could get all the data, like academics were in heaven, right. and now we're kind of frustrated because it's going back into a space that we can't see. Right. But I mean, I think the, to go back to what we don't know, the, in the Brexit example, if nobody's seen Carol Kawadala's talk and Ted, when she talks about it being a crime scene, because in the UK we have spending limits, and a crime was committed, but we've got no, we cannot go back and look at those ads. There's no archive. I mean, that a law was broken, we can't see it. So I think these conversations can be, have we got enough data or not? Is this a problem or not? And the complexity means we just need to chunk this off and then start saying, we have this, but not that. But we, I mean, I think right. otherwise we get paralyzed. That, that's valid. So there's, there's a, you know, obviously what you guys do at the FEC is, is revolves around disclosure. And uh, uh, there's then this question of how do you disclose something that, that is encrypted, uh, that, is, that is a message between two specific people that uh, it's hard to have a similar like-minded experience from one person to the next. So the challenges, what are the challenges of implementing some sort of disclosure regime over that? Uh, and, uh, you know, well, let's start there. Well, we don't actually we would never do that. I mean, right. you if, you're, if you're sending an email from one person to another, there's no right. disclosure requirement there. There's no disclaimer requirement there. Um, so are we chasing a race that is, that is already 10, 20 steps well, ahead of us? I, you know, there, you need a different solution for different platforms, I think. I mean, one of, the, one of the provisions of the Honest Ads Act is that it would require digital platforms to create the kind of archive that Claire was just talking about. Um, so that everybody could see what the ads were. And w one of the phenomena that we, um, people probably knew, some people probably knew about this, but it got a lot more attention after the last election was the way um, with micro-targeting. Individual right. ads would change depending on who they were going to, and you didn't know what your neighbor was seeing. You would see the ads on your feed, but you would, you know, those, they, those would be different from the ads on somebody else's feeds, and if you, so you need to be more flexible in your, in your definitions of what you are looking for and how you're defining it. I mean, if you're looking for things that are exactly identical, then you're never going to capture all that. And that's, that's why having an archive of all the ads would be uh, really useful, I think, and certainly helpful for uh, academics. But uh, you know, another problem that we confront is that while millions of dollars are being spent on digital advertising, there's also, you can get a lot of bang for your buck on the internet, and there's a lot of really low dollar spending that has a huge impact. So I think we have to rethink our parameters for what we want to regulate and whether money is the only indicia of uh, the kind of influence that we want to make sure people can identify where it's coming from. Okay. Uh, Barry, one thing that the, uh, the, the committee uh, that, that put up the white paper did not come to a resolution on was uh, this disposition of Section 230 uh, of, of the Telecommunication or Communications Decency Act of 1996, and uh, I'm, I'm curious as to your thoughts on that. We've seen some uh, uh, targeted chipping away at Section 230 with a, 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 a legislation called SESTA-FOSTA. Uh, it's sort of the first step on uh, not, not having a full uh, uh, immunity regime. Uh, but do, do you think that there is, uh, uh, you know, what do you think about the trade-offs on Section 230 and where do you think it should go? Yeah, I mean, that's a really tough, um, challenge. I mean, and, and, and Frank was, you know, obviously trying to get at this in his presentation. And, um, you know, I think, I mean, Frank, you know, uh, 
one, you know, as you said, well, first maybe we should recognize that uh, Google and Facebook are publishers and should be, have the responsibilities of publishers. And then he said, well, they're, but they're too powerful. And so therefore maybe we need to then chop them up somewhere. Now, uh, and I'd say there may be an alternative approach to that, which is actually just to strip away their advertising business. You know, that Google and Facebook should not have advertising, should not be in the business <laughs> of advertising. And advertising should sit on the, 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 the platform that is the New York Times. It should sit on the platform that is News Corp. It should sit on the platform that is the you know, St. Louis Post-Dispatch. It should sit on the platform that is Vice, that is, that is BuzzFeed. You know, and then it's like all of those publishers, they will attract the advertising to the extent that they're serving the advertiser's needs, and they are also publishers and they're responsible. You know, it's like for the content. You know, so, you know, are, you know, should Google and Facebook be in the, you know, one, one thing we probably know is that Google and Facebook should not be turned as at their present scale into publishers. So, um, you know, so I think there's a lot of different ways to approach this, and one of them, the, one of the things that will happen is that Google and Facebook will no longer be advertising supported. Well, I, I take it a step further and say that uh, targeted ads should be banned entirely. Um, so, uh, uh, I mentioned the Telecom Act of, of, of 1996, and I mean, maybe if we're talking about the political power of, of, uh, of digital platforms or platforms of any kind, we should be talking about iHeartMedia, which used to be called Clear Channel, and which uh, uh, monopolized the radio dial for, for talk political talk in particular, um, is that, uh, uh, is reversing that or something along those lines in terms of media consolidation a, a step that you would uh, be in favor of? Because that, that, that seems to be the, the underlying pr uh, uh, premise of your, your, your discussion. Yeah, so I don't, I hope nobody misunderstood what I was trying to say. I uh, actually think that the government has a regulatory role uh, and that role becomes more important as media concentration increases, which is, again, why uh, the, it was seen uh, as justified to regulate broadcast TV, but not so, you know, so heavily newspapers, because newspapers are just more competitive. So yes, I do think uh, that is the case. Uh, and I think that the, the way that the FCC uh, used its power to uh, regulate uh, legacy media should be a precedent for the way it could potentially regulate the platforms. Because if you think about it, they're about as concentrated as ABC, NBC, and CBS were back in the, right. you know, the 1960s. Uh, so in terms of the legitimacy, I think, yes, definitely. What I don't see is where you're going to get the political consensus uh, to do this. Um, and. Uh, you know, on what grounds you're going to exercise I mean, I, that power. I suppose the question is whether or not the existing authority uh, is sufficient uh, uh, to, and, and Barry says it is, right? So, I mean, maybe you could elaborate on that, on how our existing authorities are sufficient to uh, 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 drop these concentrations of power within digital platforms. Yeah, I mean, I think uh, we're, I'm not, uh, I don't think Frank and I are disagreeing. Frank, so is there the political will? Can we sort of concentrate the political power to achieve this? And you know that uh, remains to be determined. I think yes. You know, I I, uh, I do. I think it's reasonable for people to have doubts. You know, that's we have to go organize. Um, you know, um, the you know the exact pathway. And I think it's like you know. It's like the exact pathway that we're going to get to where we want to go. We, there's actually maybe a hundred different pathways or two hundred different pathways. There's, you know, uh, there's, uh, uh, you know, when you look back at American regula regulatory approaches over the last 250 years, um, you know, it's 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 usually principle based. It's not sort of approach based. So it's like you you kind of know what you want to achieve, and then you use whatever tools you can, you know you can actually bring to bear at that moment. Uh, you know, so. What we did with telephones is very different than what we did with with um, uh, uh, with um, uh, the, the the electrical system. So, um, you know, I think that um, you know. But the, the the thing to understand is that the you know, this is actually an area where I agree with with uh, uh, you know uh, uh, Dennis and some of the other people who were talking this morning. It's like antitrust can't do everything. Antitrust, as understood, is what the DOJ and the FTC does. They can't they can't do everything. But what we have to understand is that the, what the, the American government is our anti is, is our anti-monopoly tool. 
that's what we created government to, to protect us from concentrated power. So it's like government in every single a part of its, 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 its capacities, every single one of its capacities, those are the tools we should be looking at. So we were talking before about how many different parts of the federal government actually has some level of antitrust authority. And yeah, yeah, I mean, it's like, you know, it's like, I mean we've talked about the, uh, the DOJ, the FTC, the FCC, yeah. but it's I'm like the Federal guess. Reserve, uh, uh, the Treasury Department, uh, you know, the DOD, uh, uh, you know, USDA, uh, you know, uh, Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms, whatever it's called nowadays. You know, it's like all these things, and also every single state, every single U.S. state by law has the exact same authority on, on, on antitrust as the federal government does. Now, that was what the Clayton Act said. It's like we don't trust. You know, maybe the federal government will be taken over. Every single state can use this law to achieve these same ends, and we should never forget that the, the Microsoft case came out of the states and was forced under the federal government, which was unwilling at the time, uh, which was not happy at the time to take it. Uh, so there's an immense number of tools at all these different levels. There's an immense number of approaches. You know, and I think it's like, you know, people have said we do need to study this stuff. And it's like, yeah, it was, we actually need, uh, there's no one absolute way forward. Uh, there, we actually have to figure out, you know, we, you know, just working together. What are the best set of tools to use? Uh, but I have great confidence that the people in this room and the 320 million other Americans out there, we can figure this out. <laughs> uh, Claire wanted to add something to that. Uh, <laughs> Uh, yeah, yeah, I just ahead. I think in lots of these conversations, the piece that's always missing is the public. And so when you spend a lot of time looking at this, you realize that as humans, there's lots of great things about us, but there's some really dreadful things about us. And so the idea that actually newsrooms would be, if they were the only ones that were advertised or funded, I really shudder to think what those headlines would look like. They're pretty bad right now because they're clickbaity, because they need eyeballs. I can only imagine if it was that competitive what it would look like. And I would love to make legacy media stronger, but if you spend any time with anybody under the ages of 25, they're not going anywhere near legacy media, and they're going to find a place where they can connect with the types of media that they want. And so, again, when we think about platforms with the Christchurch shooting, there was a great piece by John Herman in the New York Times who said, we've always had places that you could find suicide and mass death. It just wasn't on the platforms. They were on the internet and you could always find them. Now they have found a home on the platforms and it makes us feel uncomfortable because we can see it. But people right. will always find those spaces. So I think the one thing I think about regulation that I would love to see, because we do need to experiment, we can't just keep sitting on panels saying, woe is us, and then getting drunk afterwards. <laughs> and we've actually got to do something. And so for me, it's how do we experiment with different models? And we can't get people off Facebook right now because of the network effect. And so we can, and still we, and we have some kind of data portability to try. Like that, because if we throw spaghetti at the wall and we realize we want humans to do that, but they're over there eating that spaghetti, uh, that we have to have a way that we can actually experiment because at the moment public aren't going to go anywhere else. And one thing about your your sort of your work and and it, it is experimental in the sense is it's sort of a monitoring regime. It's just sort of a spotlight regime of uh, and and I'm wondering how that might scale. Uh, you know, bring this into the the domestic context of of how you could create some sort of independent. I mean, we have fact check organizations and yeah. they're very derided yeah. in the United States. So I, I, I mean. How do you build trust? How do you uh, build sort of a, a monitoring regime that, that then can be responded to? So a, a, a big part of this is when we all started worrying about this two and a half years ago, people would talk about media literacy. And then others would say, we've not got time for that, love. Can we just have an algorithmic tweak? <laughs> now, three years later, we've realized we can't just have an algorithmic tweak. And we haven't actually thrown the proper money at media literacy. And we haven't properly evaluated it. But what I would love to see in terms of when we talk about monitoring, monitoring can easily become surveillance. And we have to be Absolutely. really careful around that. But rather than putting people through media literacy programs with PowerPoint slides and a game at the end to check whether they've learned anything, <laughs> what does it mean to actually inform citizens and say, you are part of this? And that actually, if you are seeing things in your community groups, then there's a part of them, it's not surveillance, like looking at your neighbor, but at the moment, we haven't found a way of bringing the public into this at all. They're not at these convenings. The platforms aren't bringing them into them. Tarleton Gillespie's book about um, custodians of the internet is excellent, saying, how can we think about governance where the public are part of it? And I just, I just think that in, th in these conversations, that th that's the piece that's missing. And otherwise, or we have paternalistic conversations believing that we're all really good humans, and if we just invest here, they'll all go over there and read news about Syria. <laughs> They're not going to. So. There you go. And the other issue yeah, about uh, digital me uh, literacy that uh, Nate personally points out in his paper is that the people who most need it 
are older people. Yes. I mean, we always think about um, you know okay. pro training programs as something that you do in the schools for younger people, but the ones who are most likely to be taken in by misinformation on the internet are older folks who are less adept. On I, I've also read that that misinformation thrives in news deserts. Yeah. And, and that gets back to, to Barry's yeah. point. That's the vulnerability before 2020. Yeah. Absolutely. OK. Uh, I'd like to go to the audience now. Uh, we just have a few minutes for, for questions. Uh, anybody? I saw a hand go up right here. Um, oh. I have a, we'll go to you. Uh, I meant her, but that's all right. We'll go, you can go first. And, OK. Oh, thank you so much. Um, thank you very much to the panel. I really appreciated that Claire brought up the issue of smaller platforms because as someone who studies online hate speech and extremism, one thing we often see is that accounts are banned off of mainstream platforms and then the same people may open new accounts in these smaller areas. And so when you all are thinking about mechanisms of accountability and regulation, I'm wondering how you take into account this broader online ecosystem, and if these accounts start on Facebook and then are banned and moved elsewhere, are the larger platforms then off the hook? And I just would like to hear a little bit about how you're thinking about Good that. Point. Anyone want to take that? Well, look, I uh, think it's going to be extremely hard to ban bad people from using the internet to meet. I mean, I, I don't really see how you're going to do that. <laughs> but if you take it off of Facebook or YouTube, uh, the scope of who they talk to is just going to be smaller. I mean, what you really have to worry about is not the true believers that are going to be hating regardless, but whether their influence spills over into other groups that you know they could recruit. And I think the smaller the platform, the less likely that's going to happen. But yeah, of course, it doesn't solve the. Uh, and there's also something the about the algorithmic prioritization of conflict and and polarization that is yeah. a feedback loop within these large social media platforms that drags people in, yeah. right? Um, and actually, there may yeah, be, uh, just, a, just real quick, is, you know, this issue of size, that, uh, in the case of the size of the platforms, it may actually matter, you know, with the smaller platforms. Maybe we do treat smaller platforms as publishers in, in the I, same, yeah. and, 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 and require them to be responsible for what's published on their, on their site. Whereas with a very large platform like a Google, uh, you know, where they have 90% of, you know, certain, um, um, market share, uh, maybe that wouldn't be the way to go. I guess the question oh, is, there's yeah. some anecdotal evidence, right, that actual offline violence is being organized on these smaller platforms. So, and that's again something that we need more data to study, but just wanted to put that up. More data. Uh, okay. So I have a question about the, the, the difficulty of um, defining some uh, of, of the criterion fair and balanced. So this is something that Francis Fukuyama was talking about. And I just wonder, I mean, when you take someone like Alex Jones, I mean, what he says is not only hateful and damaging, but it's also demonstrably false. I, it seems to me that um, that clearly falls outside the spectrum of what are the things that are fair and, and balanced. I, I would have no problem in saying that that doesn't satisfy the test. It seems to me that um, organizations like the BBC, um, I do not remember, uh, I'm sure maybe Claire does, exactly what their mandate is, but I think they m must be obliged to present several points of view. But I don't think they would think that Alex Jones has to be, his point of view has to be presented. They, they're wrestling with this kind of issue every day. I think it's even true of PBS in this country has some sort of mandate like that, and they seem to be able to uh, satisfy it. So um, I just, it seems to me it's more doable than you, you were suggesting. No, I don't think it's, I don't think it's doable in our country right now. And this is the point I was making about these European public broadcasters. Uh, you can do public broadcasting in Britain and Germany and Scandinavia because there's an underlying degree of social consensus and political consensus. So these are widely trusted institutions and people are willing to delegate to them the uh, authority to decide what is, um, you know, what is simply false and, and what people ought to be uh, listening to. Uh, I just think that in our country, unfortunately, that social consensus is gone. Uh, and the measure is not whether Alex Jones is objectively uh, unfactual. I mean, in fact, 
a lot of people are unfactual. He's, he's a lot worse than, than most other people, but you know, it, it is a spectrum, and there's a significant number of Americans that think that even if he is lying about these things, he ought to be given an opportunity to you know, present this alternative point of view. Uh, so yeah, I wish that we had the kind of society uh, and by the way, it's changing in Europe uh, in, in, in our direction. So right now, you know, ZDF has come under a lot of criticism from uh, the AFD uh, supporters because uh, they do not accept this consensus view that they actually represent grown-up views about, you know, what's responsible news and so forth. They've been excluding, you know, their particular nationalist uh, point of view uh, and so forth. And so I think that's the big issue. Uh, it's where American society is, uh, rather than, you know, can some adult make a decision as to what's, you know, out of bounds and what's not. Uh, do, how, many, how much time do we have for questions? Maybe one more or? Two more, okay. Uh, okay, Maurice. And I'll give you. Thanks so much. Uh, this is a question for Ellen. Uh, one of the things that we heard through, throughout this conference as well as earlier conferences is how economic power can translate into political power. One of the things that we don't, we've never had it at any of these conferences is someone from the FEC to talk about Citizens United. And based on your perspective within that agency, what impact did that Supreme Court decision have? And is it overstated? Is it understated? Are there unique insights that the public hasn't seen that you could share with us? I think it's had a huge impact, and, but not the impact that people expected when the decision first came down. What people thought was that um, because it empowered corporations to be more politically active, that um, the might of you know, all of these corporations that we've been talking about and all the other corporations out there, just billions of dollars in wealth was now going to be thrown at politics. And the reality is that for most big corporations, for publicly um, traded corporations, they don't want the grief of, they have too many customers, they have too many stakeholders, they have different shareholders with different points of views. They probably have even board members with different points of views. They don't want the hassle of being seen as being out there on um, uh, political issues or advocating for or against different candidates because they're not gonna make everybody happy. So when corporations spend money, they tend to spend money by giving it through trade associations. You know, the Chamber of Commerce spends a lot of money on politics, and that comes directly from big business corporations, and they're more comfortable spending that way, so it's not pegged to them. But what has happened is, um, well, there's a, a couple of problems. One is that when corporations can spend, that also means it, it's great, uh, greater power for C4 organizations, which are dark money groups, and they end up spending more money, and we don't know where it's coming from. And I think that's bad for democracy, because I think everybody is better informed when they know who's behind the, the ads that they're seeing, and they can better evaluate them that way. Uh, and it also helps to ensure that we're not getting money funneled in from illegal sources, which has happened. Uh, including from foreign sources. But the, but the big winners as a result of Citizens United, because they led to um, the creation of the super PACs, are the mega donors. Uh, in the 2018 election, there were um, 126 people, uh, individuals or couples, who gave over a million dollars through a variety of, um, you know, through super PACs largely, because you can't give that much to candidates and, um, and party committees. Uh, there were 12 or 13 individuals or couples who gave over $10 million. And there was one family that gave over $100 million to different political uh, committees that were spending money in our politics. And those are the ones that we know about because they're doing it through disclosed entities. That doesn't even count the ones who are funneling their money through C4s and other organizations where we don't see the donors behind them. We have now a massively supercharged, super empowered class of mega donors who are spending a lot of money. A very small number of people who are spending vast sums of money to try and influence not only who gets elected, but what gets enacted. And the impact of that on policies and on economic inequality, I think, cannot be overstated. 
Uh, we have time for, I guess, one more question, and I did promise right here. So. Thank you. Um, I agree with the importance of the issue of media capture, as I see that the, the newspapers and legacy media are being now owned by more and more people involved in politics, or people like we didn't mention, we were mentioning Amazon, but we didn't mention, of course, Jeff, Jeff Bezos purchasing Washington Post, and Le Monde being purchased by Czech tycoon, for example. Uh, so that is the spreading. And on the other hand, we have the issue with the new media, uh, where uh, the the increasing transparency of ad spending and the foreign interference is something that you are developing here. But Facebook and others are global platforms, and we don't see that sort of response from Facebook in other countries. It, you cannot get data, and including the foreign interference. Who gives the money, how much, and whether that was coming from Russia or China or someplace else. So I'm not sure who is the authority to, so to speak, to enforce that through Facebook and so on, but it's certainly an issue that will be important for Brazil or throughout Europe or anywhere else where you have this sort of influence from abroad. Thank you. Claire, did you have a few words on that? Yeah, I would just say the biggest lever or lever of change here is very strong journalism, but the tech press here are American and they focus English language. So, for example, Pinterest changed, anti-vax stuff came off Pinterest and they got lauded. In Brazil, they're like, no, it hasn't changed in any language other than English. And so I would love to see the tech hmm. press here understand exactly those issues that you're talking about, because the only thing that makes a difference to Silicon Valley is the American tech press. And, and who of those are here? Great. Right? <laughs> Uh, okay, well, thank you very much uh, 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 for all of our panelists, and uh, I think, uh, you know, this is a very broad topic, and we just scratched the surface, and we will continue to do so for uh, the next couple of days of this panel, so uh, enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you.